Welcome to the second lecture on Raymond Chandler's 1943 novel, The Lady in the Lake. Another video in the series, Greenwich Detective Fiction, created for the third year core course at the University of Greenwich in English Literature. In this video, I want us to look at just one aspect of the novel, the form of The Lady in the Lake, its structure and shape. Though sometimes I'm not sure that students always agree with this, the form of a text should help us read. It should help us understand what the text wants to communicate. Form doesn't necessarily close down or close off all possible meanings. We saw that with the red silk scarf. But form does create a hierarchy of preferences, of preferred meanings, by repeating certain things over time. Ah yes, there we go, the symbol for one of the six key words that recur again and again on this course. Form can make connections between different items or events in a plot that the explicit narration might not make as clear or might not make clear at all. Later on, for example, I'll be thinking about the use of what I'm going to call rhyme in The Lady in the Lake. Described time, narrated time, too, might be mobilised by a text so that we can make certain intertextual connections. That is, how the plot takes place in time. I'm not just talking about the time of reading here, the ordered succession of words in a text, our time, in other words but how time is described as passing in a novel, how many days, for example, it takes place over. Now, I'm very aware that we don't often make formalist analyses of long prose fiction anymore. More's the pity, I think, as a thorough grounding in form can really help us with our own writing, whether that be creative, academic, or just day-to-day -day communications at work or amongst friends. As I'll show too, Thinking about form isn't some empty formalist gesture, some abstracted aesthetic act. Form, because it suggests that some meanings are more important than others, is always deeply ideological, just as ideological as any contextual study. And as I'll suggest at the end, the fact that we study form at all can also suggest a hierarchy of values on our part. The study of form can be very detailed, but it can also be very general. And in this video, we'll cover a bit of both, but mainly the general, really. My analysis will certainly not be exhaustive. There's a lot more to be said about the form of the lady in the lake than I cover here. But I do want to suggest some things we might think about, look out for in our reading. I do have a warning, though. There are plenty of spoilers in what follows. I do assume you've read the novel in its entirety and already know the plot, so stop now if you don't want to find out. I shall begin with a major formal problem for long texts like novels. One aspect of form that really is designed to help readers follow a long text. And that is how to remind the reader what's happened previously and then move on. Yes, that's very, very basic, isn't it? Now you can see on the screen how the Lady in the Lake helps us repeatedly by summarising what we know. I'm not going to go through all these examples in detail. I just want to point out to you some of the ingenious ways we're helped without our even noticing it probably. And I'll focus on just one example, the very first on the screen in chapter 9. The others you can readily identify once you've been directed to them and you can find a lot more smaller ones too. The one in chapter 9 I want to discuss briefly is Marlowe's interview with Birdie Keppel. It's very clever in how it tells us what we already know, but adds more information so that we can revise what we know. Always at work is the hermeneutic cycle, which is why you can see it in the top left-hand corner there. 
we can see the hermeneutic cycle in operation in the way Birdie asked Marlowe to interpret what he and we have found. He refuses to add more than what we already know, but then Birdie herself forwards the narrative by telling Marlowe about the visit of a detective named De Soto, who has been looking for Mildred Haviland. Who? Of course, De Soto has a photo of Mildred Haviland, and Birdie notices that the photo looks like Muriel Chess. Echoes of the portrait in Henry Dunbar and the photo in a scandal in Bohemia, as I'm sure you'll have guessed. The trouble is that Birdie has also told Mildred Muriel that Detective De Soto is looking for her, and that information which Mildred Muriel probably interpreted as, as de Gamo looking for her, probably caused Mildred Muriel to murder Crystal and steal her identity. Several probably's in that first sentence, because this isn't entirely spelled out. We as detective readers have to work it out for ourselves. If it's true, Birdie Keppel, nice, helpful Birdie Keppel, caused Crystal's death. Maybe we're wrong. We'll never definitively find out, despite the summaries. As Patton says in Chapter 40 in The Showdown with DeGarmo, none of this ain't proved. This none of this ain't proved is actually key to the game that the Lady in the Lake plays with us. Summaries and reminders of the kind I'm talking about here are part of the conventional toolkit of the novel form. Because even though form is intended to help us, it can also play with us, and even as we shall see, defeat us. A good example of the game The Lady in the Lake is playing with us occurs when Marlowe confronts the key to the plot, Mildred Haviland in chapter 31. You may remember he goes to pay the woman we're led to think maybe Crystal Kingsley, who turns out in the end to be Muriel Mildred. Towards the end of their encounter, there's a very self-conscious dialogue about how the conventions of hardball detective fiction play out in real life. And you can see this extract on the screen. The virtuous Marlowe lays out the rules about summary and explanation. Murder tells detective the whole sad story, he says, and the criminal Mildred suggests that the rules be broken at this time. And it's true, we never actually find out the full story as Marlowe is knocked out by de Garmo and Mildred herself is very shortly to be murdered by him. Though, have a think about how this does play out in the end. The rules are followed when de Garmo sort of admits what he's done later on. Yet even when I read the whole conversation between Mildred Muriel Crystal and Marlowe, it's hard to see when Mildred Muriel stops being Crystal. It's hard to determine what's true and what she's making up and why. As Patton says, I repeat, none of this ain't proved. So the summaries and the meta-narrative comments, such as here, that litter the text, don't allow or even entirely encourage full closure. Despite the form that's supposed to help us, despite the summaries, the mystery is not absolutely determined, not resolved. The questions are not fully answered. It looks like that, again, the form of the novel suggests, once more, the fiction of detection. That is, the detection of the final definitive answer is impossible. It's an illusion. All we can arrive at is Marlowe's hypothetical fitting together of the pieces in chapters 39 and 40. But now for something completely different. Or is it perhaps a variant of the same? That is, a variant of constant ambiguity. <laughs>
is before I've talked about summaries as a help to readers and their ultimate lack of resolution. Well, that's all text, all black letters forming words on a white page. Now, I want us to think about the white space of the page itself. For the way the text is visually organised in modern times, that is, the text's use of white space, the relationship usually of dark to light on a page, this is in fact a key signifier of structure in today's print communications. White space breaks up the text into reading units. White space tells us when we can pause in the time it takes to read a novel, for example, when we can take a break, make a cup of tea, or if we're Marlowe, open a bottle of something stronger. It's the same with paragraphs, and indeed words, except the space between chapters is rather bigger than that between either words, letters, indeed, or paragraphs. White space, together with numbers, is a major aid to help us understand how the text organises the time of reading for us as readers. Together with the use of extra white space, number tells us that the narrative of A Lady in the Lake presents itself in 41 sections or chapters. And as we saw with the red silk scarf, each section is associated on the whole with the way described space is organised too, just as plays and films are often organised around location and scene. In the Red Silk Scarf, I offered a detailed analysis based mainly on how spatial relations between characters change. A change can be as small as sitting down, or as large as a geographical shift from one street to the next, or one country to another, or one town to another even. Almost always, these are associated with paragraph shifts within the chapter, of course. That is, with additional white space in either case. In Henry Dunbar, the white space between chapters is sometimes used to conceal something from us. It's being used to play a game with us, as when Margaret goes to see Henry Dunbar and the chapter just ends. Blank white space. Or here, which is just dropped down on the screen for you. When Henry Dunbar and Joseph Wilmot walk into the grove by the river arm in arm at the end of chapter eight, the murder and the identity theft occur in the silence, in the apparently non-textual, non-meaning white space between chapters. A white space, in this case, isn't blank and empty of meaning at all, but highly meaningful. Now, the origins of this play with white space, in Henry Dunbar at least, are certainly linked to the origins of that novel in serial fiction and the need to end episodes with cliffhangers to ensure readers return the following week. It's a technique that's certainly very well established by the time of the 1860s sensation novel. Indeed, it's entirely standard. But we also find white space like this used even now. And certainly, there are lots of examples in The Lady in the Lake. The end of chapter 39 is just one of them. It's not as if anything is not said between the chapters, as between chapters 8 and 9 from Henry Dunbar, but chapter 39 of The Lady in the Lake does end with a sudden revelation, which, if The Lady in the Lake were a serial novel, would be a cliffhanger. Now, I'm not going to go through the novel in a very detailed manner, as I did with The Red Silver Scarf. I'll stick to a larger scale, and even then I'm not going to go through the entire novel, but only give examples. What's important is to alert you to general principles of formal reading. Principles you can apply to any text, not just this one, or to texts on this course. Now, here are just the first four chapters. And you can see exactly what I'm talking about. The chapters are set in different locations. In many ways, reading and understanding the novel means creating a conceptual map that connects different places, not just 
geographically, perhaps not even geographically, even if, as we'll see in a subsequent video, very many of the places mentioned in The Lady in the Lake exist in physical space. They are actually real. The map I'm talking about is a conceptual map, a map perhaps that charts relationships between people, a map of emotions and events that provoke emotions rather than height above sea level or the type of terrain. Now we'll certainly return to this and how we seem to want to overlay, well perhaps it's not really a conceptual map, but it's an affective emotional map onto physical geography. For now though, let's just have a look at the organisation of the first two chapters. And we can start with the spatial shift between chapters one and two. The chapter changes location. The chapter change corresponds to Marlowe going through the door to DeRoyce Kingsley's office. This is an act which isn't actually mentioned. I'm sure you can see it in your mind's eye. I certainly can. We are so trained to understanding the white space between chapters as a change in location. We just reconstruct it for ourselves. It's a very typical structural device, in fact, this. Now, notice in chapter two that I've written that Marlowe discovers the research question rather than, say, the mystery or the task. For as I've said before, what we're really doing on this course and in this series of videos is thinking about detective fiction as a way to explore what we do when we read and indeed write. Marlowe is, after all, a narrator. He is, in that sense, the author of his story, not Chandler, but Marlowe. And it's just the same as we present ourselves as the authors of our writing, whether that writing is creative or an answer to a question given us or one we have to invent ourselves, whether we're doing it at work or we're writing to friends. We are creating ourselves as authors and as characters. Now, chapter one is the introduction, the stepping in or to the research question. Introduction means literally a leading into. The introduction is a contextualization of the research question, which places that question in relation to the wider field. In cinematic terms, I suppose it would be a series of establishing shots, which is not quite what we've got here, but instead we see examples of wider society. The introduction typically narrows down from the general, in this case it's the 1940s West Coast society, to the personal. So what do we actually discover about this society in this introduction? Well, first, it's a society that's at war, although that's never actually stated. The very first paragraph, though, shows us the ripping up of the rubber sidewalk. Rubber was an expensive material that was used to keep noise down outside prestigious buildings. And this rubber is being ripped up to give to the government. And as Marlowe observes, the building superintendent really doesn't like it. It's breaking his heart, but it's a duty that has to be done. Men must do their duty. Now, we aren't told explicitly that the rubber, which was in short supply in World War II, was to be repurposed to make tyres for the military. And we're not told, as I've said, that society is actually at war, but readers in 1943 would reasonably be expected to realise that. The important point is, is that war and dutiful masculinity that goes against personal desire for the greater good are immediately modelled for us. This dutiful masculinity is the ground on which everything else is modelled and to which it's compared. Now, we find that this society may be at war, but it's still got the affluence and the ability to make and buy non-essential items like 
Jill Elaine Regal, the champagne of perfumes. An item whose only social function seems to be for sexual exchange. For men to attract and perhaps buy women with through giving it as gifts or in the case of women who dab the perfume in the hollow of their necks to attract men who will shower them with pink pearls. It's a luxurious, competitive, bartering, commercial world where value depends on exchange. It's heavily gendered feminine. It's a complete contrast to the first paragraph where duty and absolute values are in charge. This then is a society that seems at war with itself, where masculine duty lies outside and feminine luxury and selfishness lies within. Now, it's also a society where we find that women control communication. The first woman we encounter is the neat little blonde at a PBX, a telephone exchange. This is in the lobby of Jill and Perfumes. I've already mentioned Birdie Keppel. Well, later on, we can see her, in fact, as a kind of switchboard operator who connected people with information whom she'd have better left unconnected. And of course, we have Miss Fromzet, the gatekeeper to DeRace Kingsley, who controls communication very ably, not least through her assiduous record keeping, rather like Sherlock Holmes, as we're just about to find out. The description of Miss Fromm's at right at the beginning is worth observing closely. Notice the gender ambiguity, or the apparent gender ambiguity at least. The man's tie and the suggestion of masculine attire. The dark blue shirt and the steel grey suit. And not least the handkerchief, described in hilarious exaggeration of violence. It's quite hyperbolic, isn't it? This is definitely a society where the narrator feels out of place. His close observations and insulting objectification of everything and everyone around him, women and men don't forget, and the way that Marlowe acts in a hostile manner without needing to, suggests he feels vulnerable. He feels he's got to attack first. It's a world where even a handkerchief can cut. And yet, it's not void of hope. It's also a world where not all is lost, not yet. For cold eyes might, just might if circumstances be right, warm up. Communication may be possible after all. It's a society though where on the whole, as we find out in chapter one, Communications are often battlegrounds where dialogue is not, in fact, communication. That is, the action of creating common ground or community. It's struggle and violence. Marlowe picks a fight with Miss Fromzard, DeRace Kingsley's gatekeeper, as much as he does with DeRace Kingsley himself. The only difference being that his relations with the women are more obviously sexually predatory. But as we've seen in the previous video on Chandler, this aggression, this performance is an act. It's performed rather too well. It's too brilliant. It's melodramatic in a way. And as we revise our interpretations over the course of the novel, we can perhaps come to regard it retrospectively in this first chapter as a cover, a mask, an act to cover a vulnerable something underneath. Remember that keyword something from the last video? Inside DeRace Kingsley's office, the verbal sparring match continues until DeRace gives in and the research question is finally revealed in chapter two. Marlowe must find DeRace Kingsley's wife Helpfully, of course, this research question is surrounded 
by white space. It's a paragraph on its own. The revelation also reveals the race's own vulnerability, something that most students miss. For not only does Marlowe win the verbal sparring match, we also find out why the race doesn't go to the police instead of calling on Marlowe. You may think that Kingsley has all the trappings of success, and he does. But how successful is he really? And anyway, even if he is successful, does success mean invulnerability? Marlowe had already suggested in chapter one that he could not tell anything about an outfit like that. They might be making millions and they might have the sheriff in the back room with his chair tilted against the safe. In other words, the appearance of success might not mean success. There may be a sheriff ensuring that no one runs off with the money or destroys the accounts. And as de Race explains to Marlowe, I have a good job here, um, but a job is all it is. If my wife got mixed up with the police, ouch, he'd lose his job. For Crystal, even though she's very wealthy, and we are, I think, supposed to conclude that DeRace married her for her money, is a shoplifter. Now, I'd like to draw your attention to an aspect of form that you might not expect to see in prose. Now we'll leave chapter division. We'll move on to something quite different. Yes, mime. Now, obviously, we aren't talking about the kind of phonic duplication that we see in poetry like dog rhyming with log, but with similar circumstances and sometimes similar words that appear in the same places in a unit of reading. Now, both chapter one and chapter two end with the mystery of Miss Fromzot's sexual relations to men. The first involves Marlowe's interpretation of her reaction to DeRace Kingsley's treatment of him. And the second involves his guess about her relations to Chris Lavery. Now, in both cases, the narrator focuses on Miss Fromzot's eyes. Now, as always, I'm not going to go through the whole novel in this way. I just want to alert you to structural formal issues like this that you might miss consciously, for I'm sure that you will be responding to them consciously. What I do want to do now is turn to thinking about how the novel as a whole is structured. What we've discovered so far is that society is at war and that women's relationship to men is complicated and also that men's relationship to women is complicated. How does the novel as a whole play this out. As I've said, the novel is divided into chapters, but it can also be formally divided into three days, the first two of which rhyme through Marlowe's return home and reflections on his day, on what he's learnt. The story need not have had Marlowe go home alone, for example, between chapters 13 and 14. He didn't need to face his nightmare alone. He could have stayed in the hotel, and Therese Kingsley would probably have paid for a better room, but the formal shape of the narrative has to mark the end of the day with a return home. Marking the end of day is important. Here, Marlowe's reflection comprises the powerful nightmare where Marlowe seems in a curious way to be rescuing the blonde corpse from the depredations of a fish that seems like a corrupt old man. It's a cod Freudian dream that begs a kind of simple popular psychoanalysis of the kind that DeRace Kingsley refers to in the novel when he describes Chris Lavery as having a Casanova complex in chapter two. 
The reflection here is followed by the rituals of the morning, with showering, shaving, dressing and making breakfast. Now, perhaps you'll say the plot demanded that Marlowe go home, because otherwise he couldn't be visited by Lieutenant Floyd Greer of the Central Detective Bureau, and he wouldn't then have been able to discover that there is no Detective De Soto in the Central Detective Bureau. You remember that the reporter Birdie Keppel mentioned that a police detective called De Soto had been trying to find a woman called Mildred Haviland? But, come on, it would have been easy in plot terms for the text to have allowed Marlowe to let Sheriff Patton know where he was, and Marlowe could have rung the Central Detective Bureau on a payphone just to find out. No. There are deeper, formal, structural reasons why the narrative compels Marlowe to go home. A variant occurs at the end of chapter 22, the end of the second day, where Marlowe goes to his office and starts the evening rituals in a quiet or at least quietish space. He pulls off his tie and jacket, pours a drink or two and literally reflects in a mirror. He looks at himself in a mirror. For it is at these points that the effect of the narrative upon him surfaces, either in dream, as at the end of the first day, or here in a much more conscious and controllable form. And this reflection not only concerns what effect the narrative has had on Marlowe, but also reflects on what's important for him. What is his scale of values? Is it dutiful masculinity or commercial transaction? Is it law and justice? As we've seen in previous videos, law and justice don't always go together. Here the police on the side of the law aren't clever enough to see justice and the truth and how these haven't been achieved yet. What else is important beside law and justice? Clearly Miss Fromzett's note. But of course, Marlowe never entirely admits openly about his more tender feelings. Why would he sniff the note, though, if not for traces of her and her perfume? This is so clearly another aspect of Marlowe in his guise as courtly medieval knight. This is amour de loin, it's courtly love, amour courtois, Fin amor, the medieval chivalric and above all poetic notion of a knight setting out on adventures and performing various deeds or services for ladies because of their pure and ennobling love. It's knightly honour. It's chivalric honour that's important to Marlowe. Here, it's as if the note by Miss Fromzett were a gauge a promise, just as we see the lady in the late Victorian painting tying another version of a gauge, a scarf, onto the arm of her knight. As I've said before, this chivalric medieval literary aspect, but it also might be a Victorian version of medieval literary culture, is one of many that we're allowed to see if we want, if we mobilise those particular literary and cultural archives. It's important, I think, that it's in this moment of reflection when Marlowe alone is not acting, that the chivalric literary emerges, whether that chivalric literary is properly medieval or a Victorian version of it. It along with the gradual quieting of the city, seems to soothe Marlowe. This vision of honour and chivalry enables him to begin the third day. The third day brings us to the close of the case and the death of de Gamo. This time, the rhyme doesn't concern the rituals of Marlowe's reflections at the end or beginning of the day, but harks back to the discovery of Crystal's body 
the something I spent so much time on in the last video when I was discussing Gothic elements. The last words emphasise the something. The three men moving the car that's gone over the side of the road to reveal the something. Something that had been a man. While the something echoes the end of chapter 6, in fact, almost the exact same phrase occurs in the seventh paragraph of chapter 8, when Marlowe, Patton, the Doctor, and their assistant Andy find Bill Chess, who has hauled the body onto the pier in Little Fawn Lake. The thing that had been a woman. Now, these formal echoes, I think, have an interesting effect. First, of course, we can see how the novel is divided into three acts, if you like. It's a typical structure for a Hollywood blockbuster. I always think of the 1996 high concept film Independence Day, which similarly takes place over three days. Now, I mentioned Independence Day only because its structure corresponds to that of The Lady of the Lake. I'm not suggesting for a moment any direct connection between the film and the novel, only that they share a form that depends on described time and that they both display that form very clearly. One could cite any number of three-act plays or any other kinds of narrative. In fact, the three-section narrative is a very ancient one. It's described as early as the 4th century AD by the Roman teacher of rhetoric Aelius Donatus, and then it's taken up later by hundreds, if not thousands, of literary commentators and theorists. I don't think it's worth trying to fit the Lady in the Lake into Donatus's threefold structure of exposition, development, catastrophe. A structure I suspect you know very well, actually, you've certainly heard of it before. The Lady in the Lake is much more complex than exposition, development, catastrophe, each sequentially arranged. It's much more complicated than that, but the threefold structure will still resonate. Remember how I defined the use of resonate in a previous video? It's not a direct reference, it just vaguely recalls. I don't think we need to talk of a reference to Aelius Donatus or any particular a theorist of form or structure. Rather, the three-part structure of The Lady in the Lake is a memory of a general idea, a reworked, refashioned, remodelled memory. It's a mobilisation, a raiding of a very general cultural archive. Now, I've emphasised ritual in my description of beginnings and endings of the three days in The Lady of the Lake, not by chance. I did that partly to emphasise the ritual nature that so many critics have observed in the detective story and in crime fiction more generally, in fact, for not all crime fiction is detective fiction. The rituals, familiar and domestic as they may be, combined with a very familiar recycling of tropes and obedience of the novel, even while playing with generic conventions, as we've seen. These suggest a terrible inevitability about this story. W. H. Auden's very famous essay from 1948 called The Guilty Vicarage, an essay John Morton spoke about in his video on The Lady of the Lake, makes an explicit connection of detective fiction with a Greek tragedy. Auden even gives us a diagram comparing the plot shapes of Greek tragedy on the right with typical detective fiction on the left. Now, there is a big problem, of course, for not all Greek tragedy has this structure. Auden's probably thinking of Sophocles, Oedipus Tyrannus, which you might know as Oedipus the King. But then detective fiction doesn't always have quite this structure either. The murderers don't get arrested, the lady in the lake, for example. But the idea in general does hold. It's a kind of ideal template 
to which no individual example will necessarily adhere exactly, but which will guide any individual example. Now, how might the connection to Greek tragedy and Greek tragic structure play out? Well, de Gamo is, of course, the source of evil within the state and has to be expelled from it, executed. On the screen, you'll see that I suggest that the military play the part of the gods in this Californian version of a Greek tragic trilogy. Greek tragedy, you remember, played over three days. Previously in the narrative, the military played no part in the narrative, though they have been suggested time after time. From that very first paragraph onwards, it's kind of assumed they exist. But it's all too clear that the humans we know on the side of justice in the story, Marlowe, Patton, Andy, who happened to be in the last scene, Miss Fromzett, Bertie Keppel, perhaps, and others who aren't in that last scene, they can do nothing. Some agency beyond them has to intervene. And in this case, it's the army who seem to be swung into action as if onto some giant crane and dropped into the scene to solve the problem. And it's exactly this ma machine, this machina, that was used in Greek tragedy when the gods appeared to end the narrative and bring justice about. Justice, note, not the law. For while the sentry at the dam has orders to shoot when a car doesn't stop, it also means that Digamo can't have a trial. We can't know, really, if the story that we've been told by Marlowe is actually true. Now, it strikes me that, at least from reading Auden, that all this might be simply a narrative game with us of the kind Poe described at the beginning of Murders in the Rue Morgue. Is the structuring, which includes the rhymes, simply aesthetic, a formalist amusement designed perhaps to flatter those of us whose access to high culture archives enables us to make these connections? Well, no, I don't think so. To me, these rhymes, and this accompanying sense of inevitability, this very careful formality, these are powerful because they're based on a specific form of narrative justice that we all know well, the lex talionis, the law of retaliation. It's a narrative, it's a story, this justice. As you murder, so shall you be murdered. The rhyme that brings the discovery of the two bodies together suggests a parity, the beginning and ending of a ritual and very serious game. Muriel, Mildred, Mildred Muriel, having helped with the murder of Mrs. Almore, murdered Crystal. Muriel, Mildred, Mildred Muriel, was murdered by de Gamo. De Gamo is killed by the actions of the army, by the state, in other words. There's a chain of murders that the state, in the form of the army, finally intervenes to stop. The formal rhymes help make this clear and point to what the narrative considers the most important connections. The murder of Crystal is paid for ultimately by the death of de Gamo. For it is in de Gamo, as a policeman and therefore a representative of the state, who's ultimately responsible. Corruption must be removed from the state. Duty, justice must be done. Now at this point, I should perhaps make clear that even though I'm talking about the United States of America, where state has a distinct and geographically and legally specific political meaning, I'm using the term to mean the American government as a whole, government, not just the state of California. I'm using the term, in other words, in a European 
rather than an American sense, and in a sense that is used when it's applied to Greek tragedy. I think we need to make that very clear. So I hope I've not created any confusion here. It's not an American sense of state, but a European one and particularly an ancient Greek one. <sighs> to return to Auden's guilty vicarage, as in passages such as the one you see on the screen, Auden does admit differences as well as similarities between the detective story and classical and what he calls modern tragedy. And of course, there's a lot more than he says here. But after this paragraph, he goes on to make a claim that I find very problematic, even though, like a huge number of critics, and as you'll have guessed already, I do agree with him. I do agree with what Auden says about the structural similarities of detective fiction with Greek tragedy and its ritual nature. This is the paragraph, the one that I find problematic, that follows the previous one in Auden's essay. There's two points I want to make here. The first, well, leaving aside whether we think characters have changed in Greek tragedy, I think they are, more central here is whether we can agree that characters are not changed by their actions in de detective fiction in general, more particularly in Lady in the Lake. Well, I'll leave the first to you to decide, because I think some yes, others no. Uh, Poirot in The Murder of Roger Ackroyd, for example, is he changed at the end? But as for The Lady in the Lake, I do wonder if Marlowe at the end of the novel is quite the same as he was at the beginning. I think it depends on how we read, how we decode. If we activate archives derived from modern tragedy and modern psychology, especially 20th century psychology, I think we can in The Lady in the Lake, then we will look for clues to indicate that the characters are changed. It depends on what archive we're activating. If we simply link the novel to timeless generic conventions where the divine, the absolute and the ideal are the central organising principles and individual progress, or at least change, is either not possible or an unimportant accident, then we won't. If we see Marlowe as simply the result of a collision of generic atoms, fragments of genre casually assembled, then the idea of his character change appears less likely to us, perhaps. Unless, of course, the conventions and genre that go towards making up his character include an idea of change. It's up to us. Again, how we interpret depends on what archives we activate. And what archive we activate depends on our historical and social circumstances. Time and place of reading are vital, in other words. Which brings me to my next point. For Auden, the time and place of the detective story, its setting, its historical specificity, are what in ancient Greek philosophy are called accidents, a word I just used on a previous slide. Accidents are just not important. Accidents are not part of the essence. They are not essential to the idea of something. The real idea, the only really important thing, is the act of revelation, either of what has to happen in the future or what has already happened. In other words, for Auden, the fact that the lady in the lake occurs in California when the USA was at war, that is, in 1942 or 1943, isn't important. Only that a crime is revealed. Do you agree with that? I have to say I don't. What Auden seems to be doing in this 1948 essay, in the aftermath of World War II, is seeking to establish a universal culture, a culture shared at least by Europeans and those places where European culture dominates. Auden wants to establish the basis for a shared culture, a culture of peaceful communication of peaceful communion. 
Well, now I think we can see the violence of this idea, though I think we can appreciate Auden's attempt to build bridges at what was a terrible time. What Auden is doing basically is to abstract detective fiction from local reference and turn it into what the German novelist Hermann Hesse would have seen as a glass bead game in his wonderful novel, The Glass Bead Game, published in 1943, the very same year as The Lady in the Lake. That is, Auden is trying to turn it into a non-ideological, entirely aesthetic and intellectual pastime. The game of drafts, if you like, that I reminded us uh, just now that Poe described, that exists outside of time. Yet this view of what I've called for the purposes of this course proximity to the reader seems to me problematic. It dismisses proximity altogether. To me, it risks leaving out the politics of reading. Now, I can understand why Auden might have wanted to do that in 1948, but now in 2020, that strikes me as a very dangerous thing to do. Form does have a politics, certainly does, and to understand that particular politics, we need to understand context. And there will be another video on context coming up soon, I promise. But what I want to turn to now is another aspect of form that the Lady in the Lake mobilises to an enormous extent. Now we've already seen an example of meta-narrative commentary. In the interview between Muriel Mildred Crystal and Marlowe. And we've also seen this screen before in the videos on Poe and previously in on this video too. And of course the hermeneutic cycle works at all sorts of levels in The Lady in the Lake. What I want to raise here again goes back to Poe. It's meta-narrative, meta-textual. In the Poe, reflection upon the narrative itself was largely separated off from the story of the murders. The story of the murders is an exemplification of the theory offered in the introduction. Text and metatext, or text and commentary if you like, exist in different parts of the tale, but in The Lady in the Lake, as we've seen, they are thoroughly mixed up. And this goes as far as evidence. What is the nature of evidence? The Lady in the Lake is very conscious about the ambiguity of evidence, the ambiguity of signs. Clues might mean one thing and they might mean another. You might hear, for example, as you see on the screen, a car engine running nearby as you get into your Chrysler. It might mean nothing at all, or it might mean that you're being followed. In fact, it's the latter that's happening. But it's the same game as in the Poe. You remember how, for example, the witnesses interpret what they heard differently. Marlowe, too, is acutely aware of the unreliability of witnesses. I love this comment about the guy who sees too much. It could so well apply to him with his obsessive noting of detail, such as we saw in the previous video and indeed earlier in this one. The game that's being played now has self-reflexivity built into its very fabric. It's not separated off, as in the Poe. We've moved on really very differently. Marlowe knows that the detective is like a reader, and Marlowe knows we know, and plays with us, and we know that he's playing with us, and so on and so forth, into a mise en abime. As we've seen, the narrative is sort of tied up at the end, which it can be in fiction, if not, as Detective Floyd Greer says, in real life. We are readers who want that one compact knot, even as we know that life isn't like that at all. We like playing the game, which has a clear structure and a clear outcome. And yet this self-reflexivity lends the story a very artificial air, it cuts it off from the real world, even while it's connecting it. The meta-narrative, the meta-textual uh, nature of the text means that the text 
can't really claim to refer to reality even while it does so. At least according to Chandler, as we saw in the last video, it's realist, but it's also not. It knows that realism is an artificial construct and makes that very clear. Now, in making appeals to common sense everyday life, which the novel repeatedly does, it is, of course, mobilizing empiricism. The discourse of empiricism, of course. That is, the system, the system of organizing ideas, that all our knowledge comes from our experience and our experience comes from our senses. We don't inherit knowledge or get it breathed into us by the gods or God, or even get injected by lecturers with knowledge. We don't get inspired. We learn it from material encounters with the material world. We know from our own experience that signs are ambiguous. We know that experience, from experience rather, that remembering too much is a sign that the narrator is making something up. We know from experience that life isn't tidily structured into three acts with rhymes of various kinds. And that in turn makes us doubt Marlowe, whose eye for detail is so extreme and so evocative. Experience tells us that we need to be suspicious, we need to read like detectives. And the meta-narrative comments that litter the lady in the lake confirm that we need to behave in that way. How reliable is he really? It's part of the game. Oh, I love this very minor example at the bottom of the screen there. When the plot requires Miss Fromser to remember details, she feels she has to justify her excellent memory, not just by referring to the plot, but on duty. It's her duty, it's her job to remember details. Now, we all know about jobs and how we have to do certain things and not others. Miss Fromser or Marlowe or the text or Chandler is playing with our knowledge which we derive from our real world and lived experience. Knowledge we've gained from our senses. It's all immense fun and confirms our faith in empirical ways of constructing the universe. It also of course shows whose side Miss Fromsett is really on. The side of duty. But of course, this isn't abstract, this isn't timeless. Empiricism is historically and geographically limited discourse. People haven't always believed in it. People have believed that knowledge is breathed into us by the gods, for instance, or that there's no knowledge possible at all. Form to me, with its clear hierarchization of knowledge, is ideological. And if we accept that it is ideological, then we have to think of the power games that form plays with us. Even the meta-narrative, the meta-textual games that the novel plays here. There's power involved. In the end, I think our reading suspiciously leads us to the question of who's in charge of reality in this plot, in this game. Chandler? Us? Marlowe? Something else? Well, the question is the game we willingly enter into and we derive pleasure from. What's rather wonderful is that we like it when the text wins and we lose. We prefer it when the not is tied together. If it isn't, we're disappointed. We think, ah, I could have done better than that. We like it when all the elements are tied together into one compact knot. We like form, structure 
coherence. We like to be defeated by the text, to see forms only at the end of the novel, not the beginning or in the middle. Form until the end is a guide. At the end, it's a complete gestalt, a complete image, if you like. We want to be tantalised with the prospect that we can see the whole all the way through, but we really don't want to see it until the end. The question for me is why? What is the motive for our analysis of form? Evidently, by analysing form, we're playing into the games that the text wants us to play. I'm going to suggest to you that perhaps we gain pleasure from aesthetic formal play because such formal play is a sign of the labour that went into the text. We like it precisely because we couldn't have done better. It's like going to a restaurant and appreciating food that you can't make at home. You wonder at the skills and hard work that went into the dish. You don't know how it's done, but you know that it's done well. And it's exactly the same with our appreciation of the formal games that texts play with us. And this appreciation of labour is also an exaltation of labour. The labour we believe went into a work lends that work value. A carefully crafted text we think is more valuable than one just tossed off carefully. Think a fried egg versus a souffle. Now, apprising a text in this way presupposes a particular version of economics. It's called a labour theory of value, which, depending on who and how you read, is associated either with Karl Marx or Adam Smith, who I discussed in the last video and Henry Dunbar right at the end, though in a radically different context. Now, it's not necessary to go into the detail and who invented the notion really isn't the point. Rather, I'm suggesting that in appreciating a text formally, we enter into an imaginary relation with an object that is hugely simplified. In reality, in our day-to-day -day lives, the value of things doesn't depend on how much work someone put in to make it. Value is much more complicated than that. How much you paid for your copy of The Lady in the Lake depends on capital investment in the publishing company. It depends on market analysis of how much we're likely to pay for it. It depends on the production costs of whatever medium you're reading it in. It also depends on the time it takes you to read it when you could be making money doing something else. There are opportunity costs in your reading it. But for this one moment, this moment for the appreciation of form and our delighted defeat at its hands, we are held in an imaginary simplicity, a childlike dependent awe. How did they make it? And perhaps there's also the hope that one day we shall be able to learn from the formal tricks, from the recipe, and end victorious in the game ourselves.